Oh, okay, so you guys all ate lunch and you're in that sleepy, wonderful mood. I can feel a little bit of it. Uh, I'm so pleased to address all of you today with a new talk, actually. Uh, I've been working on this with my colleague, uh, Becky Vermont over there, uh, this topic of redesigning leadership. It's been a kind of a journey, and um, so it's sort of a, a risk, so we'll, we're creative, so we'll try this. Is it okay with you guys? I could ad-lib otherwise. Uh, we'll do this. Okay, so first of all, um, just some background on my own journey. Um, I'm a believer in innovation as it links to art and design, but I didn't begin my life that way. Um, my parents were a typical blue-collar uh, 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 immigrant working family, uh, often said to me, John, you know, go and make a living, go to college. That was a dream in my family. And uh, in, uh, in elementary school, what happened is um, uh, my parents came to parent-teacher conference, and um, my teacher said to my father, John is good at math and art. And the next day, he told his friend, John is good at math. <laughs> and that's how it all kind of began. Uh, I was, art was taken away from me, and in my life, I've tried to pull it back, but math is what propelled me this far. Um, because of math and the desire for math, uh, I went to MIT, uh, studied computer science and physics, and uh, had a wonderful accident in my career where I went to art school in the, in, in the meantime and made things for all kinds of people, and that worked out okay. Um, and then uh, something happened where I was suddenly propelled into a different world, uh, RISD, Rhode Island School of Design, as the 16th president. It's a small school in Providence. Uh, we have roughly 47 buildings across the campus. It's not very large, but it has a very large voice. Uh, its voice in art and design is quite tremendous. Uh, you can open up a magazine, watch a movie, touch something in your kitchen, in your house, and it's probably been touched by some kind of RISD hand. Um, so it's a place where innovation sprouts all the time. And to me, it's been a learning experience, really, uh, having not lived in such a rich environment of pure art and design. Um, because I did begin life as, as a technologist. Um, I was lucky to have had this computer, my first computer, that did absolutely nothing. Who had one of those computers? Remember, did nothing at all? And that was a great time because it couldn't do anything. You had to learn how to program software. Uh, and because of technology, I've been curious about what it does to people uh, and how it's changed our lives. Uh, this is a, a, an idea presented by Scott Heiferman, the CEO of meetup.com. The idea that before the television, we had this thing called a coffee table where you would all gather around it and drink coffee and talk. It's a wild idea. No television, no computers, peaceful time. And then the TV occurred. And when the TV emerged, our chairs were suddenly pointed at the television instead. And, of course, after the computer, a weird thing happened where you had your own personal space. And so um, this began to happen, where suddenly the idea of everyone pointing the same direction on a table kind of went away. And, of course, in the mobile revolution today, where we have all these magical gadgets, um, we're all shining computers in our face today. We're, just, we're mobile, we have this thing, it's like our own space, we're all living in these microspaces. But as we know, not truly because we're all connected um, in that digital way. But I've been curious about the digital way and how it links to being a person and how it links to art and design. Um, and there was uh, one year where I was looking at my car and my camera and noticing the size relationship didn't quite work out. If you look at the car, it's much larger than the camera, but if you look at the manuals for the car, compared to the manuals for the camera, it's sort of out of whack. And so you wonder, how did that happen? How are these things so complex, yet they're so small? And I began to be curious about this, and um, if you think about it, though, um, we're sort of in, who knows the movie uh, Groundhog Day with Bill Murray? Yeah, everyone likes Bill Murray. So um, it's kind of like Groundhog Day in the industry of technology. Um, let me present this idea to you. So first of all, that old computer we had, me and him, me and the guy over there, the old computer had text on the screen. Uh, it didn't do very much. And then uh, one day, this thing called the CD-ROM emerged. And wow, was it incredible. You could display 300 megabytes of information, images, lots of images. And so suddenly on the computer, that computer, you could see images, full-color images. You could listen to CD-quality sound. 
And in later years, you were able to watch a movie on your computer. It was incredible. This is pre-internet, of course. And then the internet happened. And it wasn't, didn't have a lot of bandwidth, and so we had these browsers that were very limited, mainly text, a few dinky images. But suddenly, you could see like large images, color images, and incredible CD quality sound. And wait, you could also see movies too over the internet. And then the mobile phone appeared on the, on, on the scene. Again, very primitive, text-based system, but suddenly, you could display images, sound, and video. So you kind of wonder, like, what's getting actually better each time the technology uh, raffle sort of like ball rolls around? And that confusion, I think, exists today, and especially in the economy today, in education today. Uh, it keeps getting faster and smaller and better, but if you look at it, it isn't changing that much. So one thing that's concerning everyone today, I've heard of this conference, is, is the crisis around creativity. You know, where will it come from? You know, we look in schools today, from business schools to technology schools, where's creativity? And um, people have said in the past, like Daniel Pink, that the MFA is a new MBA. Somewhere in the arts, that secret lies out there somewhere. Um, hopefully we'll find it out there, has been a thesis. And so I've been curious about this idea about what is an art and design that we can take, learn from in the span of innovation and also leadership. And so I had the fortune of being at a place called the MIT Media Lab for 12 years of my career and went to RISD, where there are very few computers, actually. Uh, everyone uses their hands. Uh, people, use, uh, people make things you can't make anymore. I'll walk around campus and wonder how was that made. Um, because a computer, a 3D printer can't make it. And so I'm curious about this space of making in the art and design space without technology. And this school has been around since 1877. The focus has just been on instru instruction of art and design. It's been who we are. And to give you a sense of what happens in, in, the, in, in the classes at RISD, uh, this blew me away. It was by a teacher in our first year foundations program. Uh, so what she does is she gets her class to look at buildings in the neighborhood, uh, buildings around a campus. And the goal is to take that building and draw it from every possible angle, perspective, uh, geometry. And then the goal is to reduce it, find its e essence. And so gradually what happens is as the drawings appear, they become more and more abstract, more planar, more reduced to really just... Uh, abstract geometry, but it came from the buildings. And to give you another example of that kind of innovation that happens, uh, this is a, a series of paintings by a freshman uh, of shoes in her closet. And after a year of instruction, uh, this was the same shoes. So how does that leap get taken from the real to the abstract to the real to the personal to the self? It's something you get to see in art and design uh, all the time. You get to see things that are sort of uh, impossible to do by most people. Uh, we have a glass blowing studio that uh, Dale Chihuly started, uh, where they're messing with really dangerous things all the time, but to them it's just joy, the passion of creating. That you see so much in art and design today. And also, everyone's really tired. Um, uh, they say that RISD stands for Reason I'm Sleep Deprived. Uh, everyone is on the floor, pushed to the limit to make their art. It's what they care about the most. And that kind of passion breeds a, di breeds a different kind of innovation. And uh, one thing we've been very uh, curious about at RISD is the national ag agenda around education, STEM education, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And how do we supercharge this in some way? And so we've been talking a lot about turning STEM into STEAM. Uh, we just had a, a congressional briefing last week in Washington that began to push this effort forward in our country to link uh, education and STEM to pushing it even further with art, adding STEM, adding, making it to STEAM. And why is that important? It's because innovation from art and design is a, is a given. The car industry without design would have been just that basic black mechanical machine and all the way to this day and age, design affects how we live, breathe, enjoy what we do. 
if you think about this site, uh, the Aspen Institute, uh, everything has been designed. Uh, this is influenced by the Bauhaus founders. Um, this place exudes design. That's what feels so good. The location helps, of course, uh, but the design adds to it, doesn't subtract from it. And so this kind of innovation um, is, is important uh, for me uh, in my role as leader of RISD because it's been quite hard for me to adjust. Um, let me tell you a little bit about that. Um, you know how like um, when you're a creative person, you're always like against the man, right? But like I'm the man now. Have you seen the Sprint PCS commercial? I love this. This is the one I love. Is that your new Sprint phone? Uh huh. With Sprint's new fair and flexible plans, no one can tell me what to do. I can talk when and how I want. It's my little way of sticking it to the man. But you are the man. I know. So you're sticking it to yourself. Maybe. Sprint's new fair and flexible. So that kind of creativity conundrum exists as a leader. I see some of you nodding your head. When you're a creative person, your instinct is to work against the man. But once you're the leader of the institution, it's, it's quite awkward. And we're in this time, in this day and age, you saw this morning perhaps in this session with, uh, 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 with, with the Khan Academy uh, and uh, Katie Salen about how the whole landscape is flattening. And the idea of the authority has been going away. So it's something I knew and practiced at the Media Lab. But as leader of a 130-year-old institution, it's been a curious challenge to connect those two worlds together, of the old way of leading and the new way of being. Uh, because when you think about how organizations have been traditionally run, they run on the basic hierarchy, going back to Alfred P. Sloan. Um, the idea that there are levels in the, in, the, in the organization, don't go beyond your level, uh, but as you know today, because of things like Facebook, the factory worker can front the CEO. So the whole network has changed because of it uh, inside an organization. It's also outside the organization. And so things like the organizational tree are becoming the organizational network. And the question isn't where you are in the hierarchy. It's how you maintain your connection nodes to other nodes. Um, and as president who's someone at the top of the hierarchy, living in a world that students know is this model, has been an interesting challenge, which I'll talk about. So first of all, what I've been, when I was announced as president, what happened is many people said to me, emailed me immediately, um, let's go have coffee. And I said, let's have coffee? Well, what about? Well, let's just have coffee and had many requests to go have coffee. And I was like, well, don't drink coffee, first of all. But secondly, the idea was to have a meeting to talk about things before I arrived. And so I tried to sort of change that model by having a blog where everyone could talk, to, everyone could talk with me on campus. Uh, it was a free, open blog for everyone on campus. And this was an, an experiment I ran to see what that felt like. Um, and uh, long story made short, um, it was an experiment that I realized could not work because the hierarchy exists to keep the organization stable. And when the president does something like this, it creates a whole new instability. Um, but it was, an, it was an attempt to be innovative in this, in this kind of environment. I also make videos. Uh, I make a monthly video. It's a user, it's, I, I make it with iMovie to kind of capture what's happening on campus. But I realized no one watched this movie. They could care less about the movie. I tried everything. I actually have a student who impersonates me on campus as a zombie. And I hired him to do my video. And even then, people weren't watching the video. So I began wondering, how do you communicate as at the top of the hierarchy where actually that message is not so trusted or believed? And let's see here, wrong slide. Um, and what has happened is I've been trying to create a philosophy around this uh, idea of leading with all the answers. Uh, we're open for critique all the time. Uh, I started every meeting with, like, how am I doing? Which, as a leader, you want to know, but people will hesitate to tell you, especially if you're the president. And this paradigm is really an experiment uh, in action. I have to say that this is an experiment that has had difficulties. I'm one of four presidents nationally with a vote no confidence for my faculty because this kind of disruption is different in an academic environment. And so my question is always, how do you work with this constraint 
of a creative organization, uh, living in a hierarchy, recognizing that the world has changed. And it's an ongoing uh, story, really. And so one conclusion I've come to is that um, this is from my Twitter feed. I use Twitter a lot as my public form of therapy, uh, being the leader. Um, it says here, until you can serve pizza or drinks over the web, a social media portal to foster true collaboration will be so-so. Um, it's great to make a website because it's fast and you think it'll fix everything, but uh, it often doesn't. And furthermore, if you're in a community, um, people actually don't need that thing. Let me give you an example. So I was sitting with a bunch of freshmen and asking them, why is it that I can't get to them by Facebook? And they said to me, well, John, you know, this is a small campus. And if I stand in one place, I'll bump into my friend by accident. But I said, what about Facebook? And they said to me, well, John, because I, I have high school teenagers, you know, and they're always on Facebook. And I said, well, John, we aren't in high school anymore. In a high school, you go to school, and you come home, and you don't want to be at home. So you're on Facebook. But here you're like at college with your friends. And so that was something I've been learning how to work through these models we have, these thoughts we have about social media and a campus environment and a network of people. In addition, you know, I've always believed that email is so powerful. You can blast the whole campus, everyone gets the message, but no one reads it. So I'm a big believer that the most powerful thing is, a, is that coffee conversation. <laughs> so I've come three years later to realizing that these one-on-one -on -one interactions are actually the foundations of a community. The idea of a social media community is great. Uh, at the same time, though, uh, I'm learning from a technology perspective how this, is, this has changed my view right now. And uh, what does work, uh, example, I've stopped emailing the campus with my emails, and I instead I handwrite messages, and I photograph them. Uh, I've seen people react very strongly to that in positive ways, but also strongly in negative ways, like I can't read your writing. Um, so um, if anything, uh, Feedback, being open to feedback, is part of uh, what I believe is the critical question as a leader today, when you're so open with communication in this network today. And how does innovation come into that? Uh, I believe you have to constantly experiment. And so I have a lot of experiments uh, like this that I could, I've been posting on the web about, about how do you mix face-to-face um, -face with social media. And also, the thing I've come to the conclusion of is very obvious to many leaders in this room, uh, is you have to have thicker skin. Uh, this is a piece I did for uh, a show in Paris. Uh, it's called Thicker Skin Times 75. Uh, the thicker skin is the key, but the art is how you let it out. So I've realized that making art is what keeps things, um, keeps me whole. Uh, so who, who's the artist in this room? I see Eric in the room. Artists, you know, artists, you have artists and leaders talk tomorrow. Um, artists make things to recheck their integrity, they, they come back in touch with it. And so uh, for me, I've been curious how that art can manifest. Uh, this example of some good news, uh, there's a movement by some anonymous people, have confidence in John. So things like this, there's always a plus and minus, the thicker skin balances both sides, it's uh, the interface. So this was um, a model developed by a nurse named Patty Brennan uh, a model that I think uh, really captures the challenge of creativity in general. At the bottom, there's, uh, this is like Maslow's hierarchy of needs at the very bottom of the base. So the very bottom, this is by Patty. Patty said, uh, the way to imagination, first of all, the first step is reflex. Reflex has no creativity in it. Like I push you and you moved, and so there's not something creative about that. The second level is problem solving. Like I missed my bus. So I have, to, I have to catch my bus. So I'll, I'll make up a way to solve that problem. There's not much creativity in it, but there's problem solving in it. And above that, we have creativity. It's making new ideas, uh, rubbing two ideas together, making a new solution. And the very top, she said to me, John, there's imagination. And imagination is unbounded creativity. And much of the challenge, I believe, for the leader is that you're stuck down here a lot. You're problem solving, you're reacting because crises happen every day. It's so hard to be in this space above here where you want to be. 
having imagination and creativity. And how do you get there is the question, I think, for any leader. And for myself, um, I see it as making art, being in touch with artists and designers. Uh, I had a show uh, early this year in London at Rifle Makers, small gallery in Soho, where um, I began to make things to reflect my experience as president out of little circuit boards I never used. So uh, these are very small things I made. Um, this is a piece about the cloud. They're little inductors into a circuit board uh, with a little, little white tether. We talk about the cloud computing, so it goes into the cloud. The cloud is out there. This next piece is about uh, being a parent. Uh, this is sort of that moment, you know, uh, uh, where you see your son or daughter walk for the first time. You know, that moment, you know, remember that moment? Uh, this is a sort of uh, breezy, playful. Uh, this is a guy in a park or using a cell phone, you know, walking the dog. And these kind of pieces were small practice for a larger uh, uh, piece I did around being the leader. Uh, this is called CEO-ness. You're always alone, waiting for the next meeting. You have chairs open, ready for the next person to come to talk with. Uh, and so on that theme uh, of being the leader in the chair, uh, I had an exhibition where I was sitting in a sandbox on the second floor of this building uh, where anyone could make an appointment with me for 10 minutes. And it was for four days, uh, six hours each day. And I didn't know what to expect. And uh, it was in sand, so I would take notes while they're talking and draw on the sand. And um, as I would draw on the sand, the next person is waiting. So I would stamp out the sand to make it flat so I could draw on the sand. And I wasn't sure who to expect, really. It was an open call, and it was like a, a packed list of people, uh, really of all ages, uh, that came to sit in the opposite side chair, just talk with me and ask questions. So what happened is um, people of all kinds of ages just sort of showed up. Um, many brought all kinds of issues. Um, one, and I would draw on the sand, there was one person who told me he was going to die in two months. Another person said that she was in an abusive relationship with her husband. Another was a 17-year-old who just finished her SAT equivalent in Europe and wants to know what to do with her life. And they're all coming with different questions. And the one thing I realized is that as a leader, you are, all, you are constantly connecting the network together. So I had one young person who wanted to be a curator. And I said, oh, great, because five seats ago, there was Hans Ulrich Obris, the most famous curator in Europe. And she said, really? She, she sat here? And, you know, and so like, you define how they all connect somehow, and leaders are always doing it. And, it. and it seems like not a big deal, but it's a grueling mental exercise. And through this art, I became in contact with this idea of how we lead and how do we innovate how we talk about lead, leading. I think lives in art somewhere, so in a very important place. And I have a chart uh, on creativeleadership.com, so you don't have to write this down, but uh, different sort of facets of leading creatively versus uh, traditionally. Uh, for instance, a traditional leader is a symbol of authority, the fist, whereas a creative leader is a symbol of inspiration, possibility. A traditional leader is about yes or no, being clear, whereas someone who's a creative leader is okay with saying maybe. Don't know, maybe is fine. A traditional leader is concerned with, with being right. A creative leader is concerned with being real. They're like real people. Be a person first. A traditional leader loves to follow the manual, whereas a creative leader wants to improvise, see what can be played with, uh, improvised. A traditional leader loves to avoid mistakes at all costs. A creative leader loves to learn from mistakes, loves the mistakes, actually. What can we learn from that? A traditional leader wants to be right. A creative leader hopes to be right. And so often in my own role, I'm very clear that I'm, very, I'm hoping to be right. Uh, and uh, the hope to be right is more important than being right, often, especially in this, on this complex world we live in today. And so when you think about creativity uh, and leadership, that magazine, I brought, my Newsweek uh, uh, article about creativity in our country, uh, I think there's another good side, a good story. Uh, this is a story by Time magazine around the same time. 
uh, about startups that would survive in this new economy. And of the three startups, two were founded by RISD graduates, art and design graduates. Now, how is that possible? What does it mean? It says that leaders of our design can make a different kind of impact in the world today, which is exciting. And what can we learn from them? So lastly, uh, this question of, the, of this pyramid, where do you want to be? If you want to be on the top of the pyramid, uh, I think innovation, uh, innovating as a leader, somehow borrowing themes from art and design, I think is valuable. And lastly, uh, as, uh, uh, after this, uh, I have a, a book with Becky. I have a, also a show at Adobe. Uh, museum has a show on this theme of craft making. And also I'm on Twitter. So that's the overview of redesign leadership. I have time for questions. And thank you for your attention. <laughs> and there are microphones in the room. Back there, two over there. Hi, good afternoon. My name is uh, Shagun Alagunji with the uh, Bezos Scholarship Program. Oh, I'm here there. in the Sorry. back. Oh, someone else started? Um, where are you? Sorry. Okay, Mike, uh, Mike, next there, please. Thank you. Um, so I guess my question is in terms of leadership and redesigning leadership, um, one of the challenges that um, I continue to be faced with is how do you create feedback as a, as a culture within an organization without taking away the stability that you mentioned that people in the system want in terms of decision making and, and taking away your decision making or the leader's decision making sort of uh, power or authority? Uh, um, oh, thanks for asking that. Um, you know, when I had the blog where I could talk with everyone, um, it was absolutely terrible because I was trying to solve everybody's problems, <laughs> really. Uh, and I can't, because I have people that are hired to solve those problems. And uh, when I stop doing that, then the hierarchy gets reaffirmed and it's, everything is OK. But then the ability to actually communicate goes away. Um, so it may sound very simplistic, but um, I've been very active in my HR area to have more leadership training and more creativity training uh, in, the, in the leadership ranks. Uh, we're in art and design school. Yet, it is, it, that art and design ethos isn't part of who we are as leaders at the institution. So that's my experiment to bring, it, bring leadership into the training of, of our staff. Okay. Yes? Yes, um, I'm Alan Correst from Naples, Florida, and have been involved in the arts, uh, and particularly using music as, a, uh, as an important tool in education. And uh, uh, I, I appreciate your stem to steam and I wondered if you've had any um, if you have any ideas of how the arts including music could be included uh, to really improve academic outcomes oh thank you um, there's a report by the um, uh, Americans for the Arts it's a it's a roughly 10 page report actually um, that documents the impact of the arts in um, leadership and in business uh, citing music and performance art as critical in that space. Um, we're trying to garner together all these leaders in this space. Uh, at, in Washington last week, we did it. So please, can I get your, get your business card so we can, we can connect? Thank you. Yes. Um, Andy Ackerman. I'm director of the Children's Museum in Manhattan. Huh. Um, my question is about this word called scalability. Oh. And, and scale is something that leaders now, particularly in education and health, have to really struggle with to demonstrate not just effectiveness on a small scale, but on a very large scale. What struck me in what you said is you've been more reductive than expansive, and yet we're under tremendous pressure, I think, all of us in education and health, to show scale. So how do you correlate your kind of pathway with where we're being pushed in scale? Mm, thank you. Um, well, one analogy uh, I like to use is, do you guys know spray glue? It's really bad for the earth, but you spray it onto a piece of paper and you stick things, it's really, really convenient. Uh, well, spray glue is kind of like social media. It's very fast, it's very broad, uh, but as you know, with spray glue, you put the paper on and it starts to come off a bit in the edges. Um, whereas if you use like Elmer's glue, 
uh, and it, it little toothpick, little dots of glue. It takes forever to dry, uh, but it sticks. So to your point of, uh, this has scale, but it's weak connections, and this has no scale, but strong, the, the handshake is essentially that Elmer's glue. Um, to answer your question, um, I've discovered, and probably in this room, there are people that are one-man Facebooks in this room. Uh, individual. People seem, cer- certain people have the gift of being able to scale their social network, but have the toothpick glue thing. I, I, if you, if you, 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 I'm sure you met them before. There are people who can like, connect an, an entire people, entire networks of people. They have this skill that I'm very curious about learning more about, uh, because in the end, they have the key, I believe, uh, the people that can do that, people that can scale their toothpickness. Um, because the social media stuff is spray gluey. <laughs> yes? Uh, yes, since uh, it, it will be much easier to replace uh, you than the faculty, mm. uh, given tenure, uh, what are our steps are you taking to try to uh, improve your, 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 move your no confidence to a vote of confidence from the faculty? Oh. And how, how long have you been in your, in, oh, in, in, in your question. position? Uh, I'm in my, I finished my third year. The average president gets taken on the, in 1.6 years. So I made it past the 1.6 mark, but I got hit in year three. Uh, year four, how to go through year four. Um, I think that um, it's about that question of scale, going back to the gentleman over there. Um, I know I can't scale with social media. Uh, I have to achieve scale through these one-on-one interactions. Um, I think that um, I'm trying to be very on the ground and connected. Um, and... Also, that's one thing, that's the social, the social network aspect. Um, in terms of uh, getting through all this, um, I found that the students are very open to some of these ideas. At the same time, they're open to all these of the faculty as well. So how do you like, make sure that you stay not in between, but together, uh, has been also uh, part of my challenge for the upcoming year. Um, it's going to be uh, interesting next year. That's all, can, that's all I'll have to say. Uh, if you have any tips, let me know. Over here. Next. Hi, um, I'm Dima. I work at, at an embassy, and uh, structure is very sensitive. It's very important. Structure, yes. Um, and I have to play the role of a, of a leader in what I do. Yes. Um, so I'm, I'm looking at what you had in terms of the network leadership and how social media and technology um, provides people to have direct connection to the big boss, uh. which is a great, cool thing. Yes. But again, you, how do you do that and keep the structure oh. and keep it um, efficient? Ah. Oh, on that <laughs> topic, you know, so uh, I, re- I, I repurposed a hairdresser salon app online to enable anyone to make an appointment with me. Like a hairdresser, basically. I've opened up like office hours for different contingents, for, for different constituents, because it's a logistic nightmare to schedule these things. So I've been trying to make different ways to do those uh, meetings. And every meeting, I have a website as well, where I log what's happened there without names, actually, the kind of activity that happens there. So I try to like make it very transparent how to get in touch with me. Also very transparent of what I'm, who, what, what I'm meeting, who, not who exactly I'm meeting with, but what kind of person I'm meeting with qualitatively. Um, and that just started actually a couple months ago, to your question what I'm doing, is to have more and more openness access, but also less privateness at the same time, uh, to see if, I can, see if I, can, I can achieve scale that way. Because scale comes from those who can look at my list of visitors vicariously and to see what's happening. Yeah, challenge. <laughs> Over there. Thank you. Hi, John. Hi. Uh, Jeff Klein from the Wharton School. Hi, Jeff. Uh, as you're talking about organizations moving to more networked structures, how do you approach decision making? Oh, that is such a great one. Um, decision making. Well, I've come to the realization that in a university, there are two things that have to happen every year. 
you have to meet budget. And number two, you have to bring in the best quality students, students in, the, in the country or the world, et cetera. If you do those two things, everything is fine. Um, those are the big decisions you make. Um, I've discovered that decisions exist at different levels. People want to be involved. I've read every possible book on decision making and being participatory. Um, uh, my conclusion is that I have to be, I have to be a better leader, really. Uh, and so what I've done is I've uh, actually uh, gone into my, uh, my executives and been very clear on how we decide. I, I've been using for the last uh, half year or so the, the, the Bain Rapid Framework as a way to kind of like get it clear. But I can see how you have to keep on get, get, getting it clearer and clearer and clearer on who has the decision-making authority. But I think as a leader, it's upon you to make it very clear, ultra precise. I also am tested as someone who is very unclear. So I've asked all my reports, if we leave this meeting and I'm not clear, it's your job to say, John, what was decided? You know, what's going to happen? So I, 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 I expect it, and they expect it from me as well. Yes, back there. Check time. Thank you. You seem to spend a great deal of energy, both physical and psychic, trying to reach out to the folks around you to get the dialogue going, to hear, to see, to feel what's going on. Yeah. What about you personally? What kind of personal time do you need? How do you manage the inner struggle and the inner decision that then allows you to be a leader? Oh, um, I have like the world's greatest assistant, actually. Uh, administrative assistant, uh, uh, Marina is her name. Um, and with her help, I can just uh, take control of the one thing that we all don't have control of, uh, a time. I read a good, great book on organization recently about how, uh, you know how you organize your office? Organize your office. Um, you can organize into zones, like this is the stapling zone, this is whatever zone, using the kindergarten metaphor. So um, my time is organized into zones where I can put things. They're containers for time. So in one container for time I have is reflection time. And it is a container that always has to be filled. So just having a great staff that can schedule me that way. Uh, as for what I do, um, I read uh, continuously. Uh, any possible book that I could use to improve somehow. I'm sure all of us here are like, you all came here also to learn too. Uh, learning uh, makes me happy. I also jog. <laughs> yes, over there. Um, Amos. Hi. Uh, what advice would you have for people who are trying to exercise creative re um, leadership in more of a traditional organization and in more of oh. those top-down structures? Because I'd imagine there are a lot of challenges that come up with trying to do things differently in a traditional structure. Ah. Um, the best thing I read about that, because uh, everything is in books, it seems like, uh, the best thing I read about that is how um, a creative leader is someone who's restless, you know, if you weren't restless, you'd be a, a, a what's it called? A, um, was it in, in Japanese, it's called oshibana. It's uh, something to press flowers on a chair. <laughs> and so that's a rest, that you're a restless person. And so this word change always comes into that fact that you're a change agent, you're creative. That, the change agent moniker is like, kill me. And it's like, shoot me now uh, by any one organization that's, that's uh, traditional. Um, I was reading a book once about how, uh, it's actually a book by John Gardner, the book that changed my life. I, every, I, I keep reading it over and over. Who's read John Gardner on leadership? I mean, that book you can read like every day and find something new. And what he talks about is the leader is the person that's seeking for the organization to renew. And that nails everything. Like if you're always in, because constant renewal is normal. Change is bad. He doesn't say it that way, of course. But as a creative leader, I seek renewal. And you see how the world is changing. And let's renew together. We know we have to. And it's going to be fun. It's going to be exciting. And I think that's something that I think in year four, I'm challenged to bring to more people that want that message as a, as a retail uh, thing that I have to do, which I cannot do through social media. I can't email that to the campus. Um, it's Elmer's glue time and lots of uh, exercising. <laughs> Got to stay. 
energy. John, a couple years ago, you wrote a book, The Laws of Simplicity. Mm. And I'm wondering, when you're thinking about leadership and simplicity, leaders often are facing complexity, not simplicity. What's the relationship um, between those two? And how does your thinking about simplicity inform your thinking about leadership? Oh, well, it's funny because uh, uh, at the time I like, did that book, I was talking to David Kelly, who's over there from Stanford, and we were in the meadows. And David had just gotten the D-School thing going, whatever, and he said, John, wait till you become 50-something. Then people will start listening to you and taking you seriously. And I was like, wow, I'll just wait, you know? And so, and because simplicity was a theme. And suddenly when I became president, everything became so complex. Um, from simplicity, what I take uh, is design, because design is about making things feel good, making people feel good, building a strong relationship, usually through an object or an experience. So I've been trying to design myself as president to find a better experience for people to lead uh, them, to have the privilege to do that. Um, that's where I've taken simplicity. How do I simplify what I'm trying to do as president uh, has been the, uh, the ongoing challenge. To not be restless, to just seek renewal, to find scale somehow, um, to believe that arts matters in so many, so many sectors, to talk about that. Everyone wants to talk, to talk about that. It's a, it's a fact. So finding those, finding those core truths has been the, uh, the journey, really. Well, that looks good. We're on time. Well, thank you very much, guys. Yeah.